If there was an autism care pathway with clear, precise steps from assessment and diagnosis, no matter how complex, to post-diagnostic support, the whole process, we could dramatically reduce a family's stress. Since autism is neurodevelopmentally complex with differences in representation in sex, it makes sense to combine all the knowledge we can to co-produce an integrated cross-agency care plan. But research of mine noted a discrepancy. When defining care pathways, there's no uniformity. Let's think about the care pathway steps we take from assessment to diagnosis and make no mistake, these steps are important, but when it comes to the end, post-diagnostic support is independent. Good luck, my friend. Now, systems and models have been designed to take these subsystems and have them combined into a larger pathway. But surely, I thought, those pathways should show some type of empirical support and detail their teams, the doctors, the clinicians are, but all that depends on your pathway definition. See, I think a pathway should be explained bit by bit, detailing who is involved and where the families fit. No matter how much we discuss though, academically, throwing key terms around like multidisciplinary, the empirical data is lacking, but seems to show that implementation is weak and communication is slow. I've got questions for parents that have popped online, hoping the government's pathways and theirs align. I ask who's involved in your process, what's working for you? Is there a key worker or someone for you to talk it through? After that, I'd do interviews, an information collector, an inspector, maybe connector of those in the third sector. Those were the stages of the plan, at least. The third week in March, when my questionnaire was released. The more astute amongst you may have already clocked. That's when quarantine began and my office was locked. The questionnaire was online, so it could still be ongoing. Participating numbers of parents, however, was slowing. Turns out having kids at home is not conducive to having spare time. Makes participants elusive. Change my tactics, change my ethics, change this poem. Participants pick up when schools reopen. Initial results suggest that despite improvements made, some of the barriers to care have stayed. Despite the focus on integration in the current rhetoric, communication is lacking and transitions aren't slick. In terms of information, there's hardly legions and there's differences in professionals across Welsh regions. Next is interviews from home, not just more evaluation, get more suggestions for improvement and its implementation. It's been a year, but it's still my full intention to develop this holistic whole system intervention. Research in the days of COVID is not for the faint hearted, but it's important work. So let's finish what we started. Thank you. That was fantastic, Rebecca. Um, can I say, obviously, I'm, I'm a science rapper, so hearing you do all of that in rhyme just made me go, whoo, because it's right down my alley. Um, so obviously you talk a lot about autism and um, you're currently, if I'm getting this right, you're currently doing research involving the public to find out um, the state of, 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 of their situation. Um, so obviously with COVID kicking in now, um, how far are you through your research and how far may this set you back, do you believe? So my questionnaire went out to parents in the third week of March, wanting to understand the elements of their care pathway that was working for their autistic child, what needed improvement, and what those improvements might actually look like. Unfortunately, when you go into lockdown and parents had their autistic children at home, the children were now having to deal with change that couldn't be explained to them. Obviously, they can't be given a deadline as to when this will stop and that would cause, that might cause a significant amount of stress. I know that it did for myself. So I can imagine that the parents had their hands full and therefore, unfortunately, I had to keep my questionnaire open long enough to get enough respondents. Unfortunately, my questionnaire was going to be, give me the data to base my interview questions on. And if I didn't have the data, I couldn't start my interviews. So that was pushed back again and I had to change a lot of things. So I managed to start the interviews sometime around last month, six weeks ago, and the second lockdown kicked in. So it was the exact same problems again. But I think researchers and I think parents of autistic children are both known to be incredibly resilient. So this data is going to be collected. It's going to take a little bit longer, maybe four or five months, I think, has been impacted in terms of my work. 
but we're going to get there and we're going to get it done because it's very important research in my opinion. Fantastic. So uh, it was great to hear you, uh, uh, poet, I would say. It, 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 it was great. It was, it was really a delight. And I'm, I have a question, maybe not really or directly related to your actual research, but I do work in computers in school and in particular for, say, uh, adaptation technologies and so on. And my question always is, in what sense are computers a good tool for integration of all children in school or are they the opposite? computers are very beneficial actually. I think that the younger generations have a lot of access to their phones, their computers, their laptops and if anything in science communication we should be making science more accessible. We've got this idea in our heads and I don't know where it came from of what a scientist is. You know it's a person on their own maybe in a lab coat in a basement somewhere looking very closely at a pipette and that's not at all accessible to people who want to get into science. So I think that we need to challenge what a scientist is, what a scientist looks like. And one of the ways we can do that is by effective communication through a method in which is accessible to a large number of people. And I think computers, social media and technology such as that has been incredibly important, especially during COVID, when it's all we've had to connect with each other. I think it is one of the main things that we could get into as scientists in order to promote our research further and to a wider diverse population. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for your presentation and what I would love to ask you is why you chose this particular rap or poetry style to communicate your message. So once again, there's this idea of what a scientist is, but there's also this idea that science and creativity are somehow separate and that science has to be very serious. But in actual fact, a lot of scientists are creative and a lot of creative people are scientists. Think about COVID. No one has not talked about COVID since March, I can assure you. So we're all science communicators in that respect. I think I wanted to combine the creative and scientific elements of myself to challenge the idea of what a scientist looks like. And I wanted to give myself also a bit of a challenge and to just do something unique and combine those elements of my personality that I had. I had to get over imposter syndrome and thinking that I wasn't a real scientist to do this. And the response from people combining the creative and the scientific has just reinforced to me that this is the way that I want to do things. I want to be accessible, I want to make science fun, and I'm incorporating a creative element now into my PhD where I'm actually drawing out visual representations of my pathways as described by parents. So I've incorporated creativity into my thesis now, and I think it brings the whole person into the research, and that can be nothing but enriching. Thank you. I wish you all the very best with it. Thank you very much.